I really am a proponent that red meat can be healthy for you and that it is almost necessary as we age and almost necessary for women, especially over 40. It just is the perfect package for hormone balance. And that is a really big issue for women, especially over 40, really anyone over 40, men too, with um, declining testosterone. We know that zinc boosts testosterone, for instance. So I just am a huge fan of um, mostly, you know, of course, grass fed is my favorite, a grass fed meat. So I go to my track meets with my cooked steak and in my little cooler bag, and I'm notorious for being on the field before my 400 meters eating steak. Awesome. And people are like, what are you doing? Like, what is she? You're yeah. running the 400. You're going to throw up. So the 400 usually makes you so lactic. You feel like you're going to throw up. And mm. often people do throw up. But um, why don't I throw up, throw up? Well, I'm not eating carbohydrates. And carbohydrates actually directly link to increased lactic acid. Mm. So I'm eating the, you know, the high protein steak instead. And it's got things like carnosine that's buffering the lactic acid. This episode is brought to you by our pals over at HealthCode, makers of one of the most satiating meal replacements out there that's rich in protein and healthy fats. To give you a little bit of a better understanding as to how this product may benefit your metabolic health, I wanted to bring on their formulator, who's also a research scientist and professor, Dr. Ben Bickman. Here's just a quick snapshot about what went into making this formula. My focus as a scientist is to study human metabolism. Basically, I find answers to questions relevant to human health and metabolic function. But there's also a part of me that wants to go one step further, and uh, that in includes actually finding solutions to some of these problems that people face. I am convinced that the key to overall longevity and health is to properly nourish the body while keeping insulin and glucose in check. And to that end, I helped create a shake, a meal replacement shake. It's the Health Code Complete Meal. It's built on the two macronutrients, protein and fat, that have little to no effect on insulin. Also, those are the two macronutrients that humans actually need. And in addition to those two macronutrients as the base, I sprinkled in a handful of extras, including the most readily metabolized of the long chain fats, including apple cider vinegar, including some digestive enzymes just to help you get all the value from it you can and more. I bet if you give it a chance, you're gonna love it. Hopefully that background and perspective from Ben helped to give you better insights about why pairing fat and protein from whole real food ingredients is better than just having one or the other in isolation. So you can support your body's metabolic health by going to gethealth.com. That's G-E-T-H-L-T-H.com. And please use the coupon code HRI to check out to save. I'll put links below. So in today's show, we talk all about why doing short duration but high intensity exercise is better than what a lot of people end up doing, which is, you know, long volume, low intensity, kind of this long, slow distance stuff. So Cynthia Monteleone is actually running faster than she did as an elite athlete in her in her college days. So, and she's had three children. She's over the age. I think she just she's about to turn 44, I believe. So uh, she's the author of the book Fast Over 40, which is all about how to accessibly start running uh, at any age. And she has athletes that are in their 80s. She has uh, collegiate athletes. She's working with world class athletes, Olympians, uh, and much more. Uh, I've learned so much from this. And since recording this podcast in person, I've really started to sprint as well. I've noticed a lot of benefits. Um, I. I I highly recommend you do this too, especially now that gyms are like throttling back their accessibility and closing and all that. We want to do, be doing more outdoors anyway. So I really hope you enjoy this podcast. I'll put links below and links to her Instagram and links to her books. So here we go with Cynthia Monteleone. Cynthia, thanks so much for uh, that great workout this morning. So I know you had a little meal beforehand. Um, so we did um, 12 150 meter sprints on the Correct. beach. Yes. which was awesome. Um, With and, uh, a one minute and 15 seconds rest only. And then the last one we went all out, we had four minutes rest. Correct. So just want to, I'll cut to some footage so people can see what we're okay. doing. But, um, you know, I see so many people at the gym and now gyms are closed, unfortunately. So now, you know, I think this conversation is more apropos or timely because people can get so much done outside. But we see people, I saw just after our, our workout, there was a lot of people just slow jogging on the beach, like, and I was just thinking, gosh, if we could help them understand that they can get so much more out of their exercise if they increase the intensity and made the, the sessions shorter and then had rest in between. 
Um, maybe we can just unpack the physiology a little bit, like why that is, like what was happening in our muscles and why that's better. Like, you know, as an athlete over in your forties, why is sprinting kind of better than just doing these long duration cardio sessions? Well, I was first introduced to the concept that it might be better through um, my mentor, Charles Polkin, because he would always talk about how you're wasting your time if you're doing hours of cardio, if your goal is uh, fat loss or hormone balance or things like this. Um, and being that I had a little bit of sprinting background in college, um, I took it back up again. My daughter inspired me to start sprinting again. And so I started doing the research on why is this working better and why is it working for my clients and people I know, especially women over 40. And what I discovered is that um, your, your brain uh, increases BDNF for one thing, so brain-derived neurotropic factor, um, and that in turn, the catecholamines that are released help you burn fat long after you're done running, whereas opposed to when you're uh, doing slow distance, you're, that's pretty much it. You're not really burning as much fat, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> Can we pause? So, I think this yeah. is a really good okay. thing to like really hammer down and okay. underscore because when you see graphs of people exercising when they're on a bike or they're running, it looks like fat oxidation is through the roof. So people are like, well, if I want to burn fat, I'm going to hit the elliptical. But what you're just said, and the research really supports this, is this so-called people call it afterburn or whatever. But yes. So in the post-exercise window, fat oxidation is increased. Absolutely, 100%. So um, yeah, so you have a, a increase in BDNF, and you have an increase in the catecholamines that are burning fat. So if you, you can actually do less use less of the time in your day which mm -hmm. at age 40 and above we know that we have three no time. kids yeah. yeah i have three kids right um but even if you don't have kids you have a job you have things to do right. um so your your time is limited and i think that's one of the excuses that a lot of people come up with um, i just don't have the time to train or i don't have the time to work out so i'm proposing how about spend 20 minutes 30 minutes instead of an hour of running yeah. um it's just i feel like it's been a trend that when women turn 40, they think, oh, okay, well, maybe I should start training for a marathon because mm -hmm. maybe I've seen somebody else do it and they maybe dropped a few pounds. But what that happens is they reach a plateau and they can't get past that plateau and they can't get those extra few pounds off. And sprinting will absolutely do it. It'll, right. It's one of the things that will um, you know, get you really lean and without a lot of time commitment. Which, yeah, there's so many benefits. It's just but there's a lot of mental hurdles. Do you think it's my thought? We kind of talked about this yesterday. You know, my thoughts are that sprinting is more uncomfortable. It's it, it you know, cause you, you, you're in pain, right? You're building up lactic acid and things like that. So for a lot of people, they just kind of want to just go out there, put on an audiobook or a podcast and kind of check out. Um, what do you think is holding people back? Is it the information? Is it the, the workload is harder? Like what, what's in the way of them doing it? That's a really good point. I think those are both, maybe reasons um but who oh, i come from a background where we don't really listen to music where i'm, I'm taught not to listen to music while i train mm. um and that comes in the fact that you should really be focusing on what you're doing and so this is a problem in society today where people are very distracted and they do want to check out and maybe listen to something or, or they're multitasking by listening to an audiobook but that's not the time the time that they take to exercise should be the time to focus on uh, building their body into a stronger person. Mm -hmm. So I think that ditch the music. Um, uh, Charles used to say, no one's playing your favorite song during your race or match, are they? Mm -hmm. So, you know, why do you need it while you train? So I'm a little bit um, strict on that, especially with the athletes I work with. But uh, so ditch the music and focus on what you're there for. Are you there to build a stronger you? Are you there to burn fat? What is your goal and yeah. why are you there? And focus on that. And so if your goal is uh, are those things that I just mentioned, then you can just do you know do a dynamic warm up, ease into it. We can talk about all that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they don't understand how to start sprinting, and that's where I come in, and I really try to make it accessible and teach people like guess what? The way to be fast is to start slow. Mm. And uh, they they just don't understand. You can't, I don't, definitely am not saying go out there and start crushing it, crushing it a hundred percent, you know, without knowing what you're doing. Right. Um, and I think even with long, slow distance that people don't know what they're doing. 
And that's why there's so many injuries. So you have a lot of running injuries, um, Achilles, knees, all kinds of things, shin splints totally. um, with long, slow distance as well, uh, because they just think it's easy. I'll just go start running. And that's really not the proper way either. So I, I really try to hope or I'm hoping that uh, it can become more accessible to people to learn to sprint. I think it's awesome. Age. Totally. Yeah. No, it's awesome. A few things went back there. Um, first of all, when we connected on Instagram, maybe a year, year and a half ago, when I saw your handle fast over 40, I thought, oh, she's into fasting or intermittent fasting <laughs> over the age of 40. And then I saw your page. I was like, oh, she's promoting sprinting over 40, which is really cool because a lot of people, like you said, they just gravitate towards Ironmans, triathlons, mm -hmm. marathons, 5Ks, 10Ks. Um, so that's pretty impressive. One of the things that I think is a benefit for, of sprinting compared to, and I don't want to totally trash endurance athletics. I think, you know, whatever gets people outside is good, but you can do things more efficiently. And that's what we're here to talk about. But there's not this post-exercise need to overconsume food. So if you and I were to say earlier today, if we ran 12 miles, we would both be starving today. Whereas I haven't really eaten much and I'm totally cool, you know, sitting here having a conversation with you. But I found when I was doing a lot of endurance athletics is you tend to overeat and then you, I mean, calories in, calories out, probably not the only thing that matters for fat loss and all that, but it's still a piece of the puzzle. So then all these people kind of start to gain weight. I mm -hmm. noticed that um, in cycling, see that in triathlon. I'm sure you've seen that in running where people start training more. And I saw this lady say she had like a goo pack on on the beach and I'm like, <laughs> she's crushing like right. 80 grams of maltodextrin. You yeah. Know, like, well, well, she wasn't even running on the beach, so she was running on the trail next yeah, to the beach. Exactly. So she wasn't even getting the, the muscular, um, you know, tension of the resistance of the sand, which right. would have been better if she did a shorter amount of distance. Maybe she would have. Well, I still don't think she would have needed the extra carbohydrates. But no. again, it's I think it's just a, a trend that's a mentality that's happened where, OK, I run long distance and I eat lots of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have found these days that actually the opposite is better for you. in according to the science, the science backs it up. Right. And according to just our own daily uh, experiences with, uh, you know, my athletes, probably your clients as mm -hmm. well, and that it just works. Yeah, and, and like you said, yeah. not to not to trash exercising, because right. if that's what's going to get you up off the couch, then that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, the gut back microbiome changes when you do endurance running. There was a really great uh, comprehensive re review this summer that came out and it longer the longer endurance events tend to create a different gut bacteria that need that's needed to break down the food. Mm -hmm. um, for that long endurance run. So everything changes when you're when you're doing that. And mm -hmm. it seems to be, according to the research, a little bit more beneficial to have the shorter, um, more intense sessions. Running. Yeah. Which is good. Um, you know, second hurdle a lot of people say is that why well, I have bad knees or I have bad shins or whatever. You you fill in the blank with the achy part of their body. But with sprinting, um, you know, the the amount of work that you're doing, it's the duration of, is short. So the load and the stress on the body is a lot, you know, it's condensed. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have breaks in between. So do you want to talk about why that might be better for an aging athlete? Sure. Absolutely. Well, for one thing, um, a lot of joint pain we know comes from diet and not necessarily um, from uh, overuse injuries, which mm -hmm. tend to happen more in endurance training. So um, the inflammation that is uh, coming from the diet will present itself because, um, well, it's, I can get into this pretty far, but I wrote an article about um, how bacteria actually escape and go through the bloodstream and settle in our joints. So they find the inflamed tissue. So say mm. you did overuse your knees, you have inflamed tissue there. These bacteria will go and swim and live there and inflame them even more. Like it, it creates a cascading effect. So cleaning up the diet is the first thing to getting uh, strong enough um, to do any kind of exercise. Yeah. But with sprinting, you're right, you're not using it as much. You have a shorter time period. So you, you have different, um, different types of loads that keep you from overusing your joints. So yes, better for your joints. And there mm. are different various ways to sprint. So you can be sprinting in grass first, mm. and we can talk about the progression of what you maybe could do. Um, or the beach like we did today, way better for our joints. That's awesome. Yeah, and more resistance mm -hmm. for a shorter amount of time. 
Um, and we still got a very, you can attest to getting the cardiovascular benefit of it. Totally. Um, we got into the lactic zone, which was the purpose of today was to remain explosive, um, get some cardio, uh, some, you know, breath going, and then also, you know, get into the lactic zone, which is the best way to stimulate growth hormone mm -hmm. and the best way to burn fat. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I think people are afraid I'm going to pull a hamstring. Yep. So yep. the best way to start is to start strength training. And you can start doing that with dumbbells. You can do it with body weight to start. I really am a big fan of uh, not staying in the body weight category for too long mm -hmm. and um, having resistance training. So you can do a really easy dumbbell workout to strengthen the muscles that you're going to need for sprinting. And then you can progress to maybe start walking up a hill mm -hmm. um, because that forces you, your toe to dorsiflex, which is the proper sprinting form. Uh, your toe is up then. And so you're walking up the hill maybe for a couple of weeks. It depends on your level, really. Sure. Yeah. But if you're really starting from scratch, which I do work with ladies, you've yeah. met them, who have never run in their lives and they're 48 to 50 years old now running um, now for a few months and really feeling the benefits. And so that's how I started them, mm. just really, really slowly and gradually. And that really gets the, you know, the injury rate decreases tremendously if you do it that way. Um, yeah, so. that is fantastic. So, so the, the two gals that were with us today, they started how long ago? You said like three um, months? Yes, about three months ago. Um, and the one, the blonde is uh, 48. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you could have guessed that. No, it's pretty I, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other one, yeah, they're all in their late forties. Wow, yeah. That's super yeah. impressive. So, yeah, I mean, and I we think... had a couple of kids sp sprinkled in there too. That was neat. But, yeah. So this is a thing you can do with your family. Mm -hmm. Gyms are closed. Um, so you had a little, uh, stick that would tell us how much, to, like how the distance, um, do you need something like that? Or can you just find like three telephone poles? Like, um, how would you, and moving into the nuts and bolts of like, and I know you talk about this in your book and so forth, but mm -hmm. like, um, what's considered a sprint versus like middle distance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the, the set length. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the main point is to just try to remain explosive. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as you can. And so uh, I do give suggestions in my book, but some of them, you don't need the measuring wheel, although it makes it That's easier cool. if you want to be precise. Yeah. So because I'm training, uh, I have to be accountable to my coach. I have to be precise. I have to hit certain times for certain distances. But I suggest that for instance, for hills, if you walk up the, a hill for about two minutes and 45 seconds, you can, what you will need is maybe a watch mm -hmm. that would help a lot. Or I don't, people tend sometimes use their phones for a timer, but I'm very anti having your phone near you at all when you exercise. Yeah. So I would not suggest that. But if you just get a cheap watch from any, you know, local mm -hmm. store um, and time two minutes and 45 seconds to walk up the hill and um, then walk back down, then that can be your starting point. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so you can just start at that point and maybe go a little longer if you want to, but not too much longer and just see if, how much faster you can get every week, starting out with walking, then maybe jogging and then getting faster and faster as time goes on. I love that. Yeah. Now, just why 245? Is that... Um, that's about 200, it should be about 150 to 200 meters. So okay. any longer than that, you might start getting into the endurance zone. Mm. Um, you can absolutely go shorter. I am a, a 400 meter sprinter. So I'm in the lack, I'm on all three energy systems, but I definitely get into the lactic zone, which is awesome. Um, but there are plenty of sprinters who just do 30 meters, 40 meters. And when you want to do that, if you want to be a short sprinter, then you can just get on a field to start with and run for say 20 seconds mm. and then walk back and do that several times. Mm -hmm. and you can run a little bit shorter as you get faster. So it just, yeah. You can vary, but you don't need fancy equipment. Right. You can just get on a field and run at your own comfortable pace, not yeah. full, for you know, twenty seconds, and then walk back. I like yeah. that. For maybe ten times, we'll say. Yeah, and yeah. then if it, the sets are shorter, like twenty seconds or something like that, mm -hmm. the rest then would be shorter. Um, like not once... necessarily. The intensity would be a little bit higher. I see. Yeah. So okay. if we were to do that, we're a little bit more experienced. We've, mm. I, we've been running. Um, we would go at maybe, we'd start at maybe 70% or 80% for the first couple, make sure we're really warmed up. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I would have you do a, a long dynamic, you know, 10 minute dynamic warm up first. But then we would get into this 
uh, accelerate a little bit and then we would go for maybe like 80 to 90 percent mm. um sprinters don't often go 100 percent there's different ways of thinking about this mm. but uh, you go 100 percent on race day but if you can it's almost like a, the one rep max right you know you're not doing that every time you work out totally same thing with sprinting you don't have to go 100 percent every time you can go several times in the 90 percent range mm. and uh yeah you don't need anything fancy you can do it out if you can just find a field somewhere um that's awesome if you just have a hill on a road um you know just be mindful of having really great running shoes so that your shins are supported and mm. uh, compression socks are fantastic for supporting your shins and as well sending blood back up to your heart faster so, okay yeah those are all great tips yeah. and i frequently uh, encourage my clients you know find a hill in your neighborhood and try it like start there when you do some intervals because it's easy to like get your heart rate up quicker and then it's less wear and tear on the joints you know mm -hmm. you have gravity working in your favor and all that mm -hmm. so i think that's fantastic um so there's some people in the strength and conditioning community that i've heard over the years saying well i you know when high intensity interval training first started to come on, you know, maybe the research came out 20, 2007, 2008, in that range, maybe it's a little before, but people would say, well, I don't advise sprinting unless you have a great form. Mm -hmm. What would you, what would you say to that? Um, well, I see what they're saying as far as they don't want people to get injured, but it's the mm -hmm. same thing with Olympic lifting, you know, like, yeah. yeah, you should probably should have good form. You should learn the form. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I think as hard to learn sprinting form. Um, we went over it briefly this morning. Uh, there's just a couple tips to go over, uh, but ma mainly if you just strengthen those muscles through strength training, you're going to have a pretty easy time uh, increasing your speed as you go. Again, you're not just going out and running 100% today right. out of the blue. You're starting slow and building up your speed a little bit more and a little bit more. And mm. people have just found tremendous results from doing that like going a little bit faster than they thought they could go. Yeah. And then there's this psychological benefit where they're like, I'm so proud of myself. I totally. can't believe I just did that. And I think you probably witnessed that a little bit this morning too with my, you know, the group that came out. Totally. And I, I think that what's important is that anyone can do this. Um, I mean, you know, to your ability, of course, but it doesn't take someone, people always assume that I was some world-class runner in college or something like that. Yeah, I had some experience, but mm -hmm. I do believe that anyone can start wherever they are. Mm -hmm. I have friends that are 83 years old and sprinting, wow. and they're pretty fast. There's a, probably a couple of videos on my Instagram you can see, but um, they strength train three times a week and they just keep consistently doing it. Mm -hmm. They didn't start fast, they built it up over time. So, that is so it cool. really, it, it's accessible to everyone, I believe. I love yeah. that. Are they on the beach barefoot as well sometimes or? They do all kinds of training. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. I would love seeing someone in their 80s running on the beach, like sprinting on the beach. That was, yeah. That's so impressive. Well, my friend Krista Bordinon, she's a multiple world champion. She comes to Maui every year from Canada mm -hmm. and we get together and we run together. And so, so I'll cool. have her running. She'll be, yeah, I think she's going to be 83 or 84. She's going to mm -hmm. be 84 this year. Coming. Wow. So we'll try to get her on the beach and yeah, yeah. I'll video it for you. <laughs> That's great. I would love that. Um, you know, one thing I found like I, my right Achilles, I'm not trying to make this about me, but you know, I can see people saying, why well, I have a bad Achilles, why I have this running in the sand. I noticed like towards the end, I could feel just a little bit in my calf, but it's over time you're probably, cause you are getting a little more stretch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so is there any downsides to running in the sand barefoot? Um, you are going to get more of a stretch in your calves and your Achilles. But again, like by gradually building up the speed, it's just going to strengthen those muscles over right. time. Now, Achilles um, is one of my specialties that mm. I deal with because I deal with so many runners and my clients. I work with a lot of Olympian runners. And what I've found is actually there was a really interesting study that came out that identified um, uh, spontaneous Achilles ruptures had staph infections wow. and they took muscle biopsies from the hamstrings of the same individuals and there was no staph. So what was happening is possibly that this staph bacteria was again attracted to the inflamed tissue and living there. And I have found that there are certain things dietary wise that you can 
intake that really mitigates the Achilles pain. Like, so I've been able to metabolically reverse Achilles tendonitis in two weeks, Whoa. sometimes longer. Yeah, yeah. And with no other training or rehabilitation, I'm not saying this is like the perfect solution for everyone, but it's definitely an option. And wow. that involved um, eliminating sugar. Um, so maybe like less than eight grams a day from whatever sources. Uh, eight, eight grams or less, um, definitely eliminating grains, eliminating dairy, mm. and uh, introducing coconut oil so, because mm. the coconut oil has monolaurin, the mm -hmm. lauric acid, and uh, monolaurin is also found in breast milk. So I always joke around, hey, if you don't have any breast milk candy, then just go with the coconut oil. Nice. But uh, yeah, so this is one of the few things that kills uh, resistant staph. So they um, just take shots of coconut oil or mix it into their protein shakes, and wow. within two weeks, that Achilles tendonitis is gone. That is so fascinating. Yeah. So they have a diet induced bacterial overgrowth or imbalance in systemic tissues that is causing inflammation, weakening the tendon, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yes. Wow. And um, Charles wow. used to say it's different for it, He barely started talking about this um, before he passed, but um, if you kind of listen to some of the stuff he used to say, and of course I was um, privileged to have his ear all the time, but so I was, would always ask him a lot of questions. But he would say, like, it's a different bacteria in your elbow. If you have elbow, mm. like tennis elbow or elbow pain, it's usually blastocyst hominis. Mm. So it's a different bacteria for different joints, which is really interesting as well. I Super think there's a lot of work to be done in that area where the scientists haven't, they've just barely started looking into it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the microbiome project really started in 2012 and they're looking at the skin and the eyes, ears, nose, everything. But yeah, this idea and what comes to mind is like pain perception where some people have a high pain tolerance, whereas other people say with autoimmunity or things like that, you know, they, their perception of pain is, is increased so mm -hmm. that these hard intervals or weight training and they can't do it because it like hurts so much. And you wonder like how much mm -hmm. of that is the brain sensing things or is the dimmer switch just turned on because the systemic inflammation, I think yes. it's kind of interesting, but um, people eat really clean diets and, and you know, manage their circadian rhythms and do all the right stuff from a mindset lifestyle standpoint can tolerate um, a lot more pain, a lot more load physically. So it's, I think it's really fascinating. Yeah. And why can't we all do that? Totally. What's the excuse? You know, yeah. you, anyone can do that. Like I, I'm just an average mom, you know, I was uh, probably 20 pounds overweight after my last child, which I advice to anyone who's breastfeeding don't try to lose weight you need it to feed your child so that's not the time to do it but you know when you're done breastfeeding if you want to get fit again then start making choices like i really try to empower people to make choices yeah. um it's all up to them they can do that they can they can push their body to become a superhero themselves their own superhero right. so maybe not comparing themselves to the best Olympian in the world or something like that, especially if you're over 40, because as we get older, you know, our, we have sarcopenia and dinopenia, we're trying to stave off, mm -hmm. but you can be your own version of your own superhero. And I really, really try to empower people to do that. That's so it's my awesome. passion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if, if an average person looked at your Instagram, they might be like, oh, well, she probably doesn't have kids. All she does is work out all day and things like that. But you just started rerunning, so to speak, at mm -hmm. what, like six, seven years ago? Four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah, and it took me wow. two years to become a world champion. That is so amazing. Yeah. And you were matching or beating your college times? Oh, last year in my world championship win, mm -hmm. I ran faster than I did in college, which should not be happening. That is so <laughs> at amazing. All. At 44. At Right, yes. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Cool. So I, yeah, I ran faster than college and I li listen, I had a great college coach there. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, I didn't have a good college experience. I ran division one track in mm -hmm. uh, North Carolina and my, uh, coach came from legend of Clyde, Clyde Hart who coached Michael Johnson. Wow. So I had a fantastic experience. I got faster from high school to college. So I was putting in the work. It was great, mm -hmm. but I was not making great food choices. I didn't know. I just didn't know. Yeah. So my passion is to try to share this information with others so that they can make better choices. And as we age, there's just, there's no telling what anyone can do. Right. Yeah. That is so fantastic. Well, maybe let's kind of pivot a little bit more okay. towards nutrition because I think that's really interesting. Um, one of the first messages you sent me is, you know, hey, before I you know, do a big, big event, you know, while my competitors are drinking Gatorade and Powerade and oatmeal and whatever else, you're having ribeye with maybe some raspberries. I was like, wow, that is really cool. <laughs> so maybe you want to talk about 
we'll get into big picture nutrition, but just so people can understand like how at stake adapted you are, you know, at this point, I think it's neat. Yeah. Um, so I, I do cycle carnivore a couple times a year just because I f it feels like, um, it's almost like a detoxification. I don't know how to describe it, but, um, but I don't stay there in that zone for most of my year. Um, but I do stay animal protein based and I am a huge fan of red meat. And I get my blood work done every year. My doctor continues to say, this is the most impressive blood work I've ever seen in my life. Um, and especially because I, I'm always throwing in extra tests, like tests, you know, B12, test zinc, test this, test that. like, mm. so I, it's not the standard blood work. And he said, throwing the net this far, I've never seen everyone come back with such great results. Anyone come back with such great results in all of these categories. So, um, you know, I really am a proponent that red meat can be healthy for you and that it is almost necessary as we age and almost necessary for women, especially over 40, um, because I really feel like the B12, the folate, um, you know, all of the really great, the iron, the zinc, it just is the perfect package for hormone balance. And that is a really big issue for women, especially over 40, really anyone over 40, men too, with um, declining testosterone. We know that zinc boosts testosterone, for instance. So I just am a huge fan of um, mostly, you know, of course, grass fed is my favorite, a grass fed meat. So I go to my track meets with my cooked steak and in my little cooler bag, and I'm notorious for being on the field before my 400 meters eating steak. Awesome. And people are like, what are you doing? Like, what is she? You're yeah. running the 400. You're going to throw up. So the 400 usually makes you so lactic. You feel like you're going to throw up. And mm. often people do throw up. But um, why don't I throw up, throw up? Well, I'm not eating carbohydrates. And mm. carbohydrates actually directly, it's directly linked to increased lactic acid. Mm. So I'm eating the, you know, the high protein steak instead. And it's got things like carnosine that's buffering the lactic acid. And the carnosine in beef is 85% more bioavailable than in a supplement. And wow. it starts boosting in your blood 30 minutes after you consume beef. So, so yeah, I did. I went down the whole research uh, to figure out why is this working so well for not only me, mm -hmm. but my Olympians who are training, you know, maybe at the Olympic Training Center or something. They're, you know, um, I'm not going to, you know, talk bad about any kind of nutritionist or anything, but they have a different training and it's all carbohydrates, it's all sugar. Mm -hmm. And sure, maybe you can sustain some athletic performance at that level, but by changing them to be what I call steak adapted, they thrive, they put on more muscle mass, they lean out, and they have all this energy that's sustained throughout the track meet. I love that. Yeah, not just, and then they get the, you know, the burst, the creatine for the mm -hmm. first phase, the ATP phase. So a lot of people think, okay, well, keto or high protein, um, yeah, maybe that's fine for endurance, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, cause the, you know, it's fat burning for a long period of time, but not for sprinting or not for power sports. Well, the science is starting to catch up that totally. in fact, you can be a power athlete and you can access the ATP through high protein, high fat. So question for you, yeah. um, if you're not having carbs, say in a 400, I mean, you were saying you're using three fuel systems, you're getting into glycogen depletion a little bit, or is it more just, well, it, it turns out that the glycogen actually tends to be spared mm. and a little bit more when you become steak or high protein adapted. And yeah, so, um, I have never been blood tested right at the moment of my race. So I can't, I can only speculate what's going on, but it mm. all makes sense of what's happening. Um, and then I also, you know, I have that, that lactic acid buffer for the end of my race and the 400, I'm in the endurance phase and the, you know, the lactic zone is really kicking in and I tend to be very strong on my finish, not only mm. through learning good form, but also because of this choice of food that I'm eating. So, and I'm not saying it's the only way, but I'm saying it's a way that people need to start paying attention to and totally. having as an option. Well, I think it's awesome. And it, it works long-term. We were talking yesterday. So you have these collegiate athletes or high school athletes who are just carving up Powerade, pasta, and this. When they stop training, if they continue to eat that way, they're just gonna put on weight usually and increase their risk of diabetes or prediabetes, dementia, all of that, which mm -hmm. starts at early ages. So well, this is more sustainable, I think, long-term. Um, and if it, can, if it can keep your power to rate ratio, so you have less body fat, more muscle mass, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the kind of the next question is, so you hypothesize that um, fat adapted athletes, so to speak, or steak adapted athletes, which I love. I think that's cool. Um, you're producing less lactic acid. 
that's what you're speculating because you're not feeding that so-called glycolysis pathway. From, yes. Wow. Absolutely. And the, the science backs that up. If you really get into the mechanics of it, um, which, you know, I was just interested. Why is this happening? Why is this working so well? Totally. And why is it? And yeah, for not just me. So it's, uh, again, you can get to a great performance in your 20s through carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. But if you're pounding Powerade or Gatorade or, you know, you're pounding pasta, you're pounding. Can I've seen candy. Oh, my oh, gosh. Yeah. The amount of candy at marathons. <laughs> OK, all of that is inflammatory. Yeah, like yeah. that is so gnarly and so bad. You know, and so, um, yeah, that you you can maybe get away with it. But what I look for and what I work with my clients is, OK, I want you to have a great performance and I want you to not have Alzheimer's totally. when you're older. So that's what I look like. So, hey, if you eat, you know, pancakes with sprinkles for breakfast before your uh, athletic event and your carbohydrate adapted and that gets you through. OK, but what I'm finding is that those Olympians are not getting through after a couple of years of that. Right. And they, they're always looking for the edge. What's going to be that one little thing that makes me better than my competition? Mm -hmm. And so they come to me and I share with, I, I analyze everything they're doing, their environment, their lifestyle, because that's a big part of it. Their sleep, huge. Right. Um, I sleep 10 hours a night. Good so I think that's a big part of why I'm able to go at such high intensities. Mm -hmm. But there are tricks to, you know, of course, why am I able to sleep 10 hours a night? Right you know, screen time and all that, I can get down. So I, I give them an analysis and then I just start picking apart what they could do better according to what's worked for my clients mm. and, and my experience and my knowledge and what I've learned. Which so, is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, for folks, if they want to listen, Peter T and I talked, did a deep dive on to um, kind of the fat adapted athlete, why they might be able to buffer lactic acid. Just one mechanism, the so-called monocarboxylate transporters that mm -hmm. transport ketones into the brain and muscles the more fat adapted you become, the more that those are inducible. And so um, the conventional dogma is like, yeah, if you don't have carbs, you can't train, but you're really shuttling more fats and ketones. And then the side benefit of that is what we're talking about now, more buffering of lactic acid, which is great. So yes, folks, and with yeah. steak, carnitine um, transports fatty acids, right? right. So another good reason. Totally. To steak. And Carnitine, I, carnosine, creatine. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, it's like the list goes on and on. Yeah. And they're just shuttling those fatty acids for fuel. So yeah. it just works. And I, we, we talk, briefly discussed, um, my husband and I coached the number one female wrestler in the nation uh, uh, last year or this year she won it. And um, I did the strength coaching and nutrition. He did the wrestling coaching along with his other coaches at the high school. Um, but she was specifically um, really under our wing. And if she had a two day tournament, she had to make weight the next day mm. by eating the carbohydrates. She's risking holding those couple grams of water with it and then maybe not making her weight the next day. So we had her totally steak adapted. Mm. She was firing totally off of grass fed beef. That is awesome. Yeah. And, and of course, some nuts, too, for some fats. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And would she have any like high glycemic carbs before? Like, um, not, not really. No, wow. not especially not day one because she had to come back for day two. So we uh, didn't want her to, you know, have to maybe hold that water. So afterwards, yeah, she can use the for ice cream. And, but. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> was, those matches can yeah. be long, right? Like oh, uh, five well, minutes yeah. or? Well, the, it's six minutes, but um, the, uh, the whole day, they have to wrestle several times, several wow. matches to make it to the finals. So maybe three matches day one, three matches day two. Wow. It's very intense. Is Wrestling intense. is a really, really hard sport. I have a lot of respect for wrestlers, right. which is why I love working with them. <laughs> That's all, Yeah, you work with quite a few. And you know, another sport like that, powerlifting, is, is sort of mm -hmm. similar where you, you, you have these kind of heats and you have to wait for other people in similar weight. Uh, you know, uh, if they can squat, say 300 pounds, then, you know, you go 315 and vice versa. But, but anyway, so you're doing a lot of work over a extended period of time. And so constantly cramming carbs, it doesn't make because you'd be sipping on carbs all day. And then mm -hmm. over time that can lead you to crash and insulin goes up. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've only done one powerlifting competition, but it was nice, like doing it keto, low carb, you know, mm -hmm. had a ribeye, MCT oil. And then periodically I'd have like some blueberries throughout the day, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like I was just slamming down maltodextrin like everyone else. And so. Correct. Yeah. That's, and that's, the yeah. crash is really important to talk about because yeah. um, say uh, for me personally, when I'm racing, I don't want that crash to come. So if I'm having a high carbohydrate breakfast and then a couple hours later I have to run, I don't want that crash to come right before I have to run. Right. It's like I see people on a roller coaster of emotion on race day. And I think one of the reasons why 
myself and my clients why we remain so calm and we have more eustress, not distress, but we change that to eustress. We're excited to compete. We're not nervous. It's because hey, we've got the B12 and the folate supporting our myelin sheets. Mm -hmm. So our nerves are great, you know, plus the fat is very, uh, you know, ketogenic type eating is very supportive of neuro, uh, you know, neural neurotransmitters and all kinds of neural sheets. So, um, yeah, so all of that really makes sense as to why I don't feel nervous anymore, which is something that did happen to me in college. I would feel very nervous and the anxiety would take over and it would deplete my energy and I wouldn't right. have that available for my race. But now I'm just, I'm like happy, I'm excited, I'm calm. I don't have that roller coaster. And yeah, you're more like, resilient. Yeah. yeah. I totally so. resonate with that. And I think this is just, a, you know, not to change gears too much, but a really important message for parents because um, I think kids are more susceptible to the, the, you know, valleys and peaks and so forth when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all seen what happens when kids have a bunch of sugar, they get you know, amped up and then they crash and then it's just like this vicious cycle. And you can really almost see just like if, if someone paid you 10 bucks and said, okay, this kid is fat adapter, eats real food and this kid eats a bunch of sugar, like which one is it? You can almost pick it out in a crowd of kids because the behavior is so much more, you know, even keeled. And some people talk about the heart rate variability improving mm -hmm. with, um, you know, being squashing down your glycemic variability and having more ketones so it's really cool mm -hmm. that you know there's all these side benefits you know from athletics yes. and yeah well i have a tip for that actually yeah. uh you've met my daughter she's going to be 16 yeah. but when she was 11 you know the hormones started and everyone says oh my gosh girls you know and they're preteen and teen they're a handful mm -hmm. but what i found at age 11 was if i put if she started to have an emotional like you kind of go, what is happening right now? Where is this coming from, this emotion? Of course, it's coming from her hormones. But if I put a protein shake in her hand, whey protein, mm -hmm. and sent her to her room, I would time it. Eight minutes later, she would be a different person. She'd be wow. fine because it was stabilizing her blood sugar. Everything was much more calm. If she came out in three minutes, it was too soon. Yeah. <laughs> she would, I'm sorry. No, but no, no, go back. That's awesome. But um, so that's my tip for if you have, uh, you know, teenage daughters or preteen or even, you know, the younger ones, just make sure they have enough protein. Mm -hmm. Like skip the sugar and make sure they have that protein because it really helps balance the hormones. And look, I, I, we talked about as we age, I believe that sprinting and eating this way is great for hormone balance too. Right. Why? Well, I'm a big fan of Dr. Gabrielle Lyon mm -hmm. that you've had on and um, she's right. Like a muscle is, you know, is perfect. Building muscle mass is perfect for managing hormones. Totally. So I'm really on board with that. She I think has that's some great awesome. material on that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. I think it's just great. And you know, prioritizing protein. A lot of women are scared of protein. You know, so having all the carbs and you get ups and downs and everything like that. So um, I could see some resistance from some parents and, oh, well, my daughter would never have a protein shake. Um, was after she r made that connection, like, oh, when I do this, I feel better. Did it take some cajoling and like bartering for her to, or she just listened to you and said, okay, uh, mom. I'm gonna yeah, do it. she liked them from the start. It's so, awesome. um, of course, you know, I, only give her grass-fed, high-quality, uh, grass-fed whey. I'm mm. sponsored by ATP Labs, so they have a really great quality product, product out of Canada. Yeah. Um, so sh I think it's, you know, the fact that it tasted pretty good helped. Mm -hmm. Plant-based proteins, oh man, I've seen them wreck kids, Yeah. Um, unfortunately. So I'm not a fan of plant-based proteins at all. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, having been in the supplement space for a while, a lot yeah. of people don't realize that the even an organic non-GMO pea protein, for example, not that they're all bad, but they can bioaccumulate heavy metals. And so mm -hmm. you can get residual arsenic or cadmium or lead. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that to the same extent in a high quality grass fed way. So Right. And what is that doing? That's depleting your zinc because yeah. the zinc's com competing for the same receptors. And as we know, zinc's encoded in our DNA. We mm -hmm. need it for everything. And especially now during these, you know, pandemic times, yeah. zinc is the way to go. Totally. So, yeah. And you want to minimize all those things that are competing for those re that zinc receptor. Such a good point. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that, there is a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals in our environment. And this is another aspect that you work with your athletes on. You shared a really cool story about, I think it was the wrestling client. I can't, I could be off, but um, they were rooming together, traveling for an event and there was a scented candle and you were getting a text message like, hey, uh, my roommate has a scented candle, what do I do? And I think this is such a great point because we have 
candles, we have skin products, we have sunscreen, we have makeup, like there's so many mm -hmm. of these compounds in our environment and, and a lot of people are oblivious to that. So do you want to share the story and then talk about how, you know, how you coach people around these? these sure, levels? no problem. Um, so when I do uh, the metabolic analysis in person, um, I one of the sites that I measure is the back of the hamstrings and that tends to tell me how many xenoestrogens the person is carrying. Mm. So I can tell right away if they can't detoxify or if they're just inundating themselves with perfumes and hairsprays and all kind of lotions, that kind of thing. Um, it shows up in the back of the hamstring. Wow. And so um, this particular client had that issue. And so we worked with her. She went from 18% body fat to 13, 12% body fat within two months, wow. um, just by eliminating all the beauty products in her Amazing. house and switching to coconut oil, organic coconut oil for lotion mm -hmm. instead of lotion, no perfumes, no scented anything. So she had really worked hard yeah. to get there. And as we know, I, well, I think you probably know, the best athletic performance happens for women between 12, you can go down to 11, sometimes 10, but 12 to 15% body fat. Wow. And for men, it's six to 10%. So there's the optimum window, optimal window for athletic performance. So the fact that she went from 18 to 12 to 13, she, her performance just skyrocketed in those eight weeks. That's so crazy. she had gotten to the world championships in Doha mm -hmm. and she's texting me, what do I do? My roommate just bought a scented candle and what do I, and I said, you gotta tell her to get rid of it. Tell yeah. her I said so, you know, whatever yeah. it is. So she, um, she said, listen, like she tried to explain it and the roommate said, hey, you've been killing it. You've mm -hmm. been doing so well. Absolutely, I'll get rid of it. And not only did my client have a personal best at that meet, but her roommate did too. Wow. Yeah. So I'm awesome. not saying it's because she got rid of the scented candle, but maybe that helped a little bit. Um, so yeah, you, all of those uh, toxins are just making our body work harder to get rid of them. And we could be using that energy for other things like being happy, right. sleeping better, yeah. <laughs> you know, Such a good point. sharing our passion with others. Um, so you want uh, people when they're fatigued or they don't have that energy, a lot of times these endocrine disruptors are, are to blame and they're just making their hormones totally out of whack. I mean, we yeah. really could talk about that for hours, know. you know, what, what it does. But yeah, so I have them eliminate anything scented. Um, they are not allowed to have air fresheners. Uh, essential oils occasionally are mm. fine, but not to overdo it. Sometimes people diffuse them all night long while I sleep, and I don't think that's beneficial personally um, from my experience. But yeah, so they just, they clean up their environment. Um, I tell them to maybe choose to live in a place that's not polluted. If, yeah. You know, if they live in a polluted city, say maybe you want to think about working somewhere else if it's yeah. really this big of a problem. Uh, so yeah, and people can do that now, which is great if they're working from home, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very grateful for where I live. Yeah, I mean, so I can't beautiful. complain. It never gets old paradise every day, but I chose to live here, mm -hmm. you know, so, and uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to prior to like make that choice, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there might be some, there's pros and cons with every, every choice. You got to like figure that out. But so the cellulite or sorry, that's, how, that's where I was going, but, but storing fat on the back of the hamstring, because mm -hmm. I do see that a lot, like just on the beach today, with like women. quite a few people, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a trouble spot. And mm -hmm. you know, you, you think about, well, why isn't that for men? What, they don't generally, well, of course their shorts aren't generally that high up, but, but men don't use as much generally um, persistent organic pollutants mm -hmm. in, in the form of hair products, lotions, perfumes, all of that. You know, Correct. I know that a lot of women, you know, all sorts of skin products have Mm -hmm. you know, these compounds. And not only that, but it gets in the DNA code. And mm -hmm. then future generations, they have children, they already pr are predisposed to carry weight there because they have lived in a toxic environment. Yeah. And unfortunately, it seems to not be getting better. So we really have to empower ourselves to make those choices ourselves to clean up our surroundings. It's so important. Yeah. yeah, that transgenerational epigenetic effect so huge. Yes, so it is. a lot of parents. Um, now here you probably sweat a lot being outside because it's pretty warm year round, but what about sauna therapy and heat and contrast? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the first questions I ever asked Charles was, how do you feel about ice or ice baths? Nice. And he, I don't know, when you ask Charles a question, sometimes like he would go through the encyclopedia of 
uh, documents in his head and he would just give you an answer and sometimes not explain why but he said 36 hours before my competition I should take an ice bath mm. and um, when I talked to some other people about why because I never did ask him why I just okay as Charles said I do you know that's what I would do and it would always work but um, it has to do I think from this with the circadian rhythms he said it would boost testosterone if you take an ice bath before competition but icing mm. after running absolutely not four to six hour window no icing yeah. um, uh, four to six hour window, no stretching, no static stretching. Uh, so definitely some tips there, but sauna is fantastic. I'm definitely a fan of sauna and of the occasional ice bath. Yeah, and, but just, yeah. so the post-exercise ice bath is mm -hmm. so-called contraindicated because does it slow down recovery and everything like that? Yes, your muscle fibers can't intertwine and heal the way they're supposed to because they need that inflammation, mm. right? So. So it's kind of like taking ibuprofen or, or an mm -hmm. antioxidant Correct. after exercise. It, it inhibits mm -hmm. that signaling that's adaptive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, you see a lot of people like, I remember when CrossFit got really popular, like in 2012, 2013, and it was like, everyone would do these big CrossFit things and then jump in ice baths. And I remember thinking like, well, there is, because that's when the brown adipose tissue research started coming yeah. out too. And I was like, I don't know that post-exercise, that's always ideal. Mm -hmm. Um and I think this, this little nuance, while some people might already know this, I think it's helpful because we see, say, LeBron James after a basketball game will be in the hotel room with a bunch of ice. And it's like, well, mm. maybe not ideal. I mean, who knows when the game was and the, the yeah. times. Yeah. And um, for me personally, my experience, I had a little bit of like a hamstring tendonitis when I first started back running. Mm. And I used to ice after I ran every day because it was bothering me a little bit. And when I stopped icing, when Charles said, no, 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 don't do that. And mm. I stopped icing, my injury went away. Wow. Yeah. So it actually was interfering with healing that and making it stronger. So I definitely have a personal experience with that. And, um, you know, I don't have to knock on wood. I've been injury free. Injuries don't keep me from competing at, uh, you know, the highest level. I ran, uh, I ran faster last year than all the high school girls in the state, which, wow. you know, is fun, but I'm why, because I'm injury free. And why am I injury free? Again, back to the choices I make right. and you can make those choices. Anyone can make Anyone. those choices. You yeah. Know? And so that I, my passion is to, to give that option, you know, to have people maybe have the uh, knowledge or the information to make those choices as well. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so realistic timelines for people like they're sitting on the couch, haven't been exercising, what, you know, to kind of button this conversation up to make it practical for people. Three months, you know, six months, like how, how long, you know. So you start walking up the hills and doing these different things and they'll read your book and, and learn more. But um, when do you think they could start like sprinting? Like, or at oh, least- I would say after um, eight weeks, they can start okay. getting on the field and sprinting. Absolutely. That's awesome. But, you know, everybody wants the results right away. They yeah. want to lose the fat right away. They want to, you know, the instant gratification. And I think that's part of the lifestyle. And I talk a lot in my book about mindset and positive self-image and, mm -hmm. All of that goes together with not seeking that instant gratification, knowing that it does take a little bit of time, but then that will give you longevity and you'll have that for a longer amount of time. It's kind of like the fad diets. Right. You know, you can calorie restrict and take uh, whatever it was that was banned, Fen Fen or whatever, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, that it never lasts. The weight always comes back. So you can kind of think about sprinting the same way. If you start slow and do it properly, it's going to give you a longer uh, value later. And it's awesome. going to keep on doing that fat burning and keep on keeping, uh, you know, having your BDNF high uh, so you can keep your brain plastic and uh, learning new things and sharp, uh, staving off Alzheimer's, for instance. So, yeah, you can have that for a longer period of time. That is yeah, really, really I would neat. say eight weeks. And I'm very inspired by the um, where I live in the ancient Hawaiian Kukini, mm. who were messengers for the kings. They were runners, specifically trained to run here in Hawaii. Interesting. So I, I think about them, you know, the, the ancient Hawaiians and how they dialed in that running. And I kind of try to take inspiration from that. And, uh, yeah, I think that anyone can, can find that inspiration as well. Right. <laughs> and that's just a, a, I think it's like a proxy of vitality, you know, like, there's some studies showing like grip strength, for example, is linked with longevity, but like, man, you know, are you physically able to like run that 80% like max effort? Like, I, you know, if you can't do that without totally falling apart, probably not a good, a good sign for things to come. Right. And of course people have joint issues or hip replacement things they got to work through and all that, mm -hmm. but it seems like, um, 
I don't know, I would feel mentally, it's nice knowing that you're able to do that, right? So why not train for that? And um, I think, yeah, just, and, and the other side, you know, to, to kind of talk about, to kind of wrap things up here with like endurance is like, if you go to the gym and you do the elliptical or you get on, you know, you do whatever it is, you're not, there's no bar, benchmark. You're just kind of doing the same effort and intensity that you probably did before. There's no, you know, you're not tracking like your splits or saying, Hey, I, you know, last week I did, you know, this in 50 seconds. Now I'm doing it in 47, you know? So that's where I, I think these me, these objective measurements are so helpful. And that's why weight training I feel like is helpful because people mm -hmm. can see their progress Mm -hmm. which is great to get a nice little watch and be able to start tracking this. Yes, and log your workouts for your saying. running. And it's psychologically, it's a confidence booster as well. So you, maybe you, uh, you know, jogged that hill in such and such time last week and you just got one second faster or two seconds faster and it keeps happening. And uh, yeah, I wasn't fast when I started out four years ago. Right. I was really slow. Um, crawled across the finish line of my first 400 meters. Yeah. But I just kept showing up. That was the thing. I, I was consistent. I just kept showing up. And what's nice about, you know, tracking your progress, so to speak, is at the weight, maybe there's a lag in, in terms of changing, recompositioning your body or losing them. At least, you know, like, hey, like we're making progress here. It's just going to take time. Like, you know, miracles don't happen overnight. So I think, you know, tracking, you know, using a log, like you were saying, and mm -hmm. you interviewed, you know, quite a few different elite uh, coaches from different disciplines. And, and that was one of the tips that kept coming up was, documenting, yes. tracking, keeping tabs on what you're doing? Yes, absolutely. The part two of my book is all contributions from um, elite athletes and as mm. well master's athletes. So my friend Krista, who's 83, and her competition, Rose Green, who's also one of my good friends. Uh, she's the same age. They're both sprinting down the track doing multiple events. Wow. Um, yeah, they gave their advice and a sample workout. Mm. So if this 83-year-old can do it, I think, you know, Again, mostly anybody could probably do it as well. So awesome. Yeah. So uh, yeah, big handful of contributions for that and for strength training. Mm. So you're not just starting blindly. You have a little bit of information to get you going. That was my next question is how to weave in the sprinting with like strength training. And then can you sprint like on consecutive days? So oh, like that's a great question. So one of the things you said earlier is that people see my Instagram and they think I just train all the time. Yeah, but yeah. I actually don't train that often. I run three times a week mm. and I'm done within an hour and um, or really less than that. Um, and then I strength train four times a week. Okay. And again, less than an hour, because if you're in the gym longer than an hour, Charles used to say, you're making friends, not progress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I subscribe to that theory as well. And it's just a really, I have a great strength coach, Malcolm William from Source Performance. Um, and I also do strength coaching myself, but I get that job done because I'm focused on mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I have all my time under tension and tempo laid out. Um, and again, with the strength training, I think that if you're older, maybe you think, oh, I can't lift heavy weights. Well, if you do tempo training, I talk about that too in my book. If you do tempo training, which is focusing on lowering in the eccentric portion slowly, say, so if you're squatting, maybe you go down in four seconds. You don't mm -hmm. just go down, back up, and bounce with heavy weight. You're using less weight. You're recruiting more muscle fibers, and um, you're less likely to get injured. Mm -hmm. So it's Just less great. daunting for um, older athletes. Totally. There's yeah. so, or you could do bands, you could do chains. Like mm -hmm. there's so many options now for resistance training that we didn't have maybe a decade ago that make it very, so accessible for mm -hmm. pretty much everyone. Um, but yeah, that, that, the tempo, a lot of people don't think about, you know, the eccentric versus concentric and they just kind of just go through the motion mm -hmm. and that time under tension seems to be really beneficial um, and probably reduces your risk of injury, you know? Yes, so, absolutely. Focusing on that. Yeah, and so um, I think to answer the second or uh, nuance of your question, I don't do them back to back. I make sure I have time in between. Again, four yeah. to six hours is ideal. So I'll run in the morning and on mm. the same day I'll strength train. And then I take the whole next day off. Oh, so cool. recovery is just as important yeah. as the training, as we know. And I have a great mountain stream by my house. I yeah. can get in that, get some soak up some negative ions and go to the beach. Right. Um, but just really uh, think about healing my body on those recovering days, recovery days. So um, that's you know three days of the week I'm training. Um, and maybe a fourth morning for the strength training. So it's really not that much time. Which is awesome. Um, I think a lot of people would look at you and be like, oh, she works out all the time. 
So therefore I need to work out all the time. And mm. I think a big, and the, the female clients I've worked with over the years, um, and past girlfriends and all that, like they, they all tended to overtrain. Like, mm -hmm. so more is better. And then they get into this rut where they're caffeinating before training and then that's a fit in their sleep. And then it's like, they mm -hmm. just, just keep digging themselves into a hole. Would your younger self have listened to you now? Like if you were in your twenties and, her and heard a tape of you, like go back, you know, back in the future, would you have believed what you're saying now? Or is there something about, Oh gosh, it's just such a different day and age with the internet and all yeah. that. But, um, I was actually just recently invited to speak to the team at my uh, alma mater college cool. and I told them everything Yeah, yeah. and that they were like, Oh, the athletic trainer is like, we're sponsored by Gatorade, you know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe was saying, said some things that were contrary to their program, uh, what they knew before. But I just, I give the honest opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I give the tough love. That's just who I am. I tell you straight how it is, yeah. uh, you know, what's the boys want to know what's the best way to boost testosterone. Mm -hmm. I said, sleep better. And here's how to do it. Here are five tips that'll give you better sleep. Yeah. What do you mean? I can't go on my phone before bed. No, don't yeah. go on your phone before bed. Dark like a cave, 68 degrees, you know, yeah. like all these things I just rattled off. So if I had had visited, if I had someone visit my team, I mm. think, and talk about that, I would have started thinking about it more. Right. But I just didn't know any better. Nobody yeah. did. And that was the line of, the line of thinking back then was pasta party before the track meet the mm -hmm. night before, you know, and uh, that's what we did. I'm so, sure teams still do that, right? Like, unfortunately, I think they do, even though yeah. it's very old fashioned. And the first uh, carb loading scientific study, they actually they would fast pretty much and not train the whole week before the race and then carb load. So they did not have carbohydrates that whole week before. But that's not what's happening now. Nobody. Everyone skips that part. They forget about that part. I didn't know that. Yeah. Either. Wow. Yeah. So if you look at the original study of carb loading, I believe it's like the 50s, something, somewhere around 1950s, they came out with it. So in that context, it makes sense. So you're really depleting your glycogen, mm -hmm. you're doing yes. a workout and then super replenishing it, so to speak, you know, and then, yeah, then your next competition, you know, you're, you're, everything is full, but if you, and you're recovered because you're, re you're not training all week, right? Like very minimal. Nobody Such does a good that. point. Yeah. Right now, people just carb up and I feel like it makes them overweight. They get they get mm -hmm. chubby often yeah. and all that. Yeah, know? they start holding it and, you know, the usual places, the belly, you know, sometimes the hips for women mm -hmm. and why they're eating inflammatory things or gut microbiomes off because, again, that the, wow, the bacteria change according to what you're eating. Yeah. Like they, they're just, I don't know. Sometimes I think we're just the puppet and they're in charge. <laughs> Probably. You know, <laughs> seriously, I think I mean, there's a lot to learn. And then also on our skin, like yeah. uh, we talked about the ocean water. There's there are billions of viruses in one liter of seawater. Mm. Not all viruses are bad. Right. We need the good ones uh, to keep everything in balance. So that's right. Well, I bring my balance. hand sanitizer to the yeah. beach. No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we must bathe in hand sanitizer oh, before man. we get in the ocean because it'll protect the reefs. No, I'm just kidding. Opposite. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think the 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 idea when, when there's like a, a, a microbi a, a microbe in lay press, people think that they're all bad and we forget mm -hmm. about commensal microbes, commensal viruses, the virome, you know, all of that. So uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. It means we were talking, you know, so going at, in the ocean, I don't like to rinse off. It's like, let, let whatever's on mm -hmm. there, salt, viruses, all that, let it do its thing with mm -hmm. the body. You know? Yeah. It's extremely beneficial in my opinion. Totally. Um, yeah. And um, coconut oil for some reason, I don't know. I haven't broken it all down yet with the science. Maybe that'll be my next reading yeah. uh, journey. But for some reason, uh, the coconut oil really keeps that microbiome in your skin in balance. So mm. when people say, well, oh my gosh, you have such great skin, this and that. And I haven't worn sunscreen in 10 years. Wow. I think uh, maybe like once or twice we make our own homemade if it's a gnarly day that I have to be out in the middle of the day for a couple, you know, a few hours. But uh, this, my skin is great because I use the coconut oil and also because of what I'm eating, you know, right. I'm eating something that's promoting, I eat a lot of, uh, glutamine and glycine. The glycine promotes the collagen. I'm not really terribly a huge fan of collagen, um, supplements. I think just take the glycine and make your own collagen. It's mm. just my opinion seems to work better. Um, but yeah, so for some reason, the coconut oil work, works really well after you shower, Interesting. um, to replenish that balance. 
keep them yeah. for the microbiome itself or the skin? I both? think so. It yeah. seems to just, and then when, if you're, say you're putting some scented lotion on instead, mm -hmm. uh, man, your hormones have to deal with that endocrine disruptor. Um, you have to detoxify all those fragrances and foreign poisons basically on yeah. your skin. And I think people just don't think about that. They think, right. Ooh, it'd be cool to smell like watermelon or <laughs> whatever the flavor of stuff. the day is. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And it just really, they become immune to the scent of it. Um, so it just, it messes with so many different systems and it's in my opinion, not the way to be your ultimate superhero self, totally. which is what I'm promoting, <laughs> which is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting how, um, if people aren't in tune with what they're eating or their exercise or all that, they don't notice these smells and like really yucky, like compact fluorescent blue light at night. Like it's interesting how once you start making these changes and then you, you see how other people live, you're like, wow, like, I don't know how, yeah. I mean, you can see why a lot of people are sick and metabolically mm -hmm. unhealthy and overweight mm -hmm. and asthma and allergies and food sensitivities and, and have mm -hmm. neurocognitive issues, um, at middle age now. So. It's happening earlier and earlier. I have a lot of clients coming to me now in their 20s who are having autoimmune issues. Wow. And it's just, it's disheartening. Totally. Um, luckily, I'm able to reverse it pretty much at that. I, we talked about my doctor sends me his patients when he can't yeah. figure out the autoimmune stuff. That's and awesome. he's a great doctor. He just says, I was trained in Western medicine. If it's this, I prescribe this. Mm -hmm. You can read the gray, so I'll go for it. Yeah. Uh, and it's great that he's open-minded to do that. Um, but. Yeah, so either they're having autoimmune issues at an early age, and a lot of this is fixed. I'm not going to try to generalize too much, but there's a trend towards plant-based, mm -hmm. and this is disrupting um, all kinds of things and causing bacterial overgrowths that are promoting autoimmune issues, like rheumatoid arthritis has Prevotella overabundance. Um, so by changing the diet, we can um, sometimes reverse these autoimmune conditions. It's amazing. And yeah. Really well, great. And I found like working with clients, um, autoimmunity can be tough to resolve and get su sustained resolution using the allopathic toolbox. Like mm -hmm. it can be tough and it just lends itself to more, more drugs like biologics. Mm -hmm. Okay. That didn't work. Well, methotrexate and by, you know, it's like these combinations of things. And then you kind of run down that and then it's like, well, the doctors go, I don't know what else to do. Like, yes. you know, we've done everything. What, what mm -hmm. do you, what drug do you want now? I literally had a client like that. And then she's bounced around from rheumatologist mm -hmm. to rheumatologist. And it's like, well, wait, no one told you about your diet, like exercise, never no ask. lifestyle, anything. They never ask. Like, seriously, it's crazy, but this is mm -hmm. happening. Like, yeah. And Western medicine is great for a lot of things, totally. not to knock that. Um, right. but I definitely have had, I've heard that same story from clients where I've been to every doctor and they can't figure out what's wrong with me or they say worse, worse, even they say it's all in your head. Mm -hmm. It must be psychological. And they're like, no, I just feel bad. I feel tired. I feel this, um, or they're breaking out in, in staph infections or rashes. Um, you mm. know, the rashes on the back of the arm, I see a lot with, uh, uh, liver, mm. like, um, liver enzymes that are maybe Elevated. fatty liver, mm. something like that. Like it just depends. I have to look at everything else, but the rash on the back of the arm or on the upper back, that's definitely an indication that there's some liver toxicity going on. Interesting. Um, but they never ask, they never right. look at that. I even asked a dermatologist once, yeah. do you ever ask about liver health or diet if you see this rash here? And they say, no, like, why <laughs> yeah, would I but I think this is based in Chinese medicine. So yeah. yeah. Well, oftentimes liver enzymes creep up and they're within the normal range. So doctors don't even say anything about them. Like mm, liver normal. AST or GGT of 47. It's right. like, oh, it's but midpoint what is in the normal? range. Yeah. I mean, it keeps getting more unhealthy, right? Exactly. That's so, yeah. the key. So let's make a new normal. You, yeah. me, and everybody else watching and, right. uh, who's empowered to make their own choices. Let's make choices that are the new normal. And it's more of a, a superhero race. I like it. Yeah, superhuman no, superhero race. Let's not just take aging and just say, oh yeah, it's normal to be sick. It's normal to have stomach ache. Mm -hmm. It's not normal. Let's let's redefine it. Right. Speaking of kind of redefining things, uh, in athletics, gender has been sort of redefined, so to speak. And we have, and it's very controversial. Um, I be, you know, as you know, a young daughter, uh, she's eight years old. Um, seeing her maybe one day competing with a former male, you know, that would be challenging, I think. And so this is really controversial in sport. Um, 
what's the big picture here and what, what's the future look like for, for young female athletes with um, the, the increased prevalence of transgender athletes competing in the female division? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked about that. Um, biology and common sense tells us that men are different from women. Right. And if you're at all in the nutrition field, you know that women have challenges, especially as athletes, like say, when they have their menstrual cycle, they need more iron. Um, they're facing different challenges that men don't have. Mm -hmm. And when um, we take a biological male and they enter a female race, um, Yes, it is really awesome that everybody gets to compete, but then they're displacing the female athlete. So they're taking away that opportunity for that female athlete to have victory. Um, because if you take comparably gifted and trained individuals, the biological male will always win. So one girl can beat one boy sometimes, but every girl is not going to be every boy, especially not at the elite level. Um, so. That being said, girls and women, they deserve a fair playing field in athletics. That's my opinion. This is not a personal issue, even though personally I, I have had this experience mm -hmm. and my daughter has had this experience already, so two generations. Um, it's not a personal issue, it's a policy issue and the policy needs to be changed to protect women. Uh, we've come a long way since Title IX and Title IX was put in place to give equal opportunities for women. Mm -hmm. And basically what the uh, transgender activist community is asking when they're asking to permit biological males to be in female races, they're asking us to repeal Title IX. They're saying Title IX never existed um, because they're taking away that chance for victory for women. And what are their standards? Are they saying that there's no biologic difference between males and females, so it doesn't matter? That's kind of the, the well, ethos they... Yes, um, they're saying that if you say there's a difference at all, basically you're transphobic. So um, they like to use a labeling narrative that I think is really, really unfair. Um, they like to pinpoint gender instead of sex, um, biological sex. Mm -hmm. And even with hormone replacements and gender reassignment surgery, uh, one study that came out last year said that males are still stronger and faster than females even after so they can meet the hormone requirements at the elite level mm -hmm. they can meet the um you know they can choose to have gender reassignment if they want they don't have to um at, and the rules right now for the olympic committee um and if they meet those uh, they'll still have more muscle mass and a stronger skeletal mass that gives them a greater advantage over women and again it's not a personal issue it's just right. a policy issue and my daughter um, and everyone else's daughter deserves a chance to be seen for scholarships. Like, uh, you know, the girls in Connecticut were displaced and not going, they didn't go to the, the finals, so they weren't seen by maybe some college coaches. Uh, and because it's happening more and more, it needs to be addressed. And uh, we just need to, you know, we want everyone to participate. Yeah. So let's let, have everyone participate, but let's not displace the girls just for, you know, the agenda. Mm -hmm. And, and what do the transgender athletes say? I haven't, I've only followed this like recently. What, what is their position? Like, well, they, they don't perceive an advantage. Right. Um, that... No, they say that um, they, the, the bottom line is that they, uh, they identify as a girl. And so everyone should treat them as a girl. Mm. Like, and if you think or say that they're not a girl, but in, in any way, shape or form, then you are transphobic. <laughs> So it's just a really cut and dry narrative that needs to be, it shouldn't be a, a partisan issue. It shouldn't be political. Um, and if you actually poll all different types of, you know, Democrat, Republican, whatever, they're all on the same page where mm -hmm. they'll say, yeah, it's really not fair. And I think most people just know, don't think it's going on, yeah. but it's going on uh, more and more. And it's going, it happened here last year. It mm. happened to me in my world championships. Wow. Um, so it's just, it's happening. It happened yeah. to you recently? Uh, a couple of years ago, mm. I did race uh, a transgender athlete, male to female. Yeah, but yeah. I, I won my heat, but that person, I think that's a, an instance of not comparably gifted and trained at that level because then six months later, they came back and ran a different race mm. and uh, took the silver. Yeah. Wow. And, and they're very, you know, again, like they're, um, yeah, they, they just want to be where they want to be, you know, mm. they want to be a part of the team um, where they identify and no one's saying don't participate. It's right. not a ban. Like I think sometimes the news headlines will take a, 
like the Idaho law and they'll say ban, mm -hmm. but it's not a ban. We, we feel, compa I feel compassion for everyone. And I think how much better, if we can solve this issue, how much better would that be for them? They would feel more comfortable racing as well. Totally. So I have compassion for everyone involved. Right. Yeah. Could there be, uh, maybe the pool isn't big enough, but like a transgender division? You know, I, mean, I am not in charge of the policy, yeah. so I can't make that decision. But I can tell you that we've, the, the leaders of the world have been around this question mm -hmm. over and over. And the bottom line comes down to it, it's just it's displacing women. Yeah. So the, the female elite 400 meter record um, uh, set by Sonia Richards Ross can be beaten last year by almost 400 high school boys. Mm -hmm. And in high school, there are no requirements in the states that allow it. So they could just show up one day and say, this is how I identify with no hormone suppression, no gender reassignment, which, you know, again, is what their the policy allows. And they could beat the fastest time any American has ever woman has ever run as a high school boy. And to me, common sense tells me this just can't be fair. So I could have in high school said I identify with being a woman and assuming that all these rules were in place back then and and assuming I had the, the, the form and everything and hold a record, for example. A world record even. That's just not The fastest fair. in the world ever in history. Yeah. That's just going to disincentivize young female athletes from putting in the work. So they're just gonna be like, look, what's the point? Like, if I'm gonna do this, I don't just wanna be like, you know, uh, middle of the packer. I wanna like try to, you know, get a scholarship or mm -hmm. go on to do something. So it's going to disincentivize. It's mm -hmm. going to just make that. That's just not fair. Yeah. Look at uh, Serena Williams or Allison Felix, you know, mm -hmm. some of the best, most beautiful, strong female examples of athletes in our uh, world. And um, just think if they can't achieve that level, like if someone, uh, someone uh, less gifted and trained comes and takes that notoriety away because they've beaten their records or they've done better than them then as a young female you think what well, if i can't even get to the olympics or be the best in the world like i don't know what is the maybe i don't even want to do track then right or maybe i don't want to play tennis then and it, i see this happening psychologically to females right now today and i just think that people don't realize it's actually happening right can tell you that it is happening because <laughs> their kids might be older they might be out of it but maybe you want to talk about your daughter and the event that that she recently encountered or was it last oh, year oh yeah so she um she had her first high school race last year we only had one track meet and then or this past year um and then covid of course so um yeah so she trained for two years and uh she would have won her heat she actually ended up with the uh the local transgender athlete in her heat mm -hmm. and um and yeah she just she would have won and she when you ask her she'll just say yeah i was disappointed that I, mm -hmm. I could have had first place in my heat, you know, in that race, I could have won my first high school race, right? but I didn't. So, yeah. and in this case, um, yeah, this individual was a very powerful athlete. Mm -hmm. So you could see it in the running. Yeah. yeah almost immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas yeah. at that level, it would be more incremental at the finish you would see. Yes. But, okay. Yes. So probably with a couple of weeks, I mean, I can't speculate with a couple of weeks more training, state champion, I yeah. mean, who knows, you know? Wow. Yeah, so, but again, not a personal issue, even though personally it has happened to us. It's sure. a policy issue. And I just have, a, um, my heart goes out for all the female athletes everywhere, every mm -hmm. age, and um, and for the transgender athletes, you know? Right. Everyone everyone needs to be, you know, be considered, but we can't choose one side and take away the opportunities for the other side, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's, these conversations are, like you said, they're hard to have though, because if you're, if you're immediately relegating people to phobia or you're anti and not able to have a dialogue, then no progress can be had. But it I seems agree. like that kind of happens with these, these sort of extreme viewpoints is that becomes the narrative is like, if you question anything, you're a grandma killer, right? If you question transgender athletes, well, you're just anti-trans and mm -hmm. we need to be able to come to a point as a society where we can you know be able to have a narrative and, and look at the issue without becoming so uh it's like so polarizing or re radioactive really i mean it's right and i think what's happening is that a lot of people um maybe also think well maybe they know so the scientists know something i don't know or maybe the olympic committee knows something i don't know but right. really 
again, common sense and biology is it you they don't. It the science points to all the science says males are stronger than females. Well, any parent that's been around young boys and young girls knows right away there is a ostensible like there's a biologic difference. Like you can tell at like even at 12 months, like mm -hmm. they're so different. But I could see how the Olympic committees and the schools are so worried about being canceled by the cancel culture mm -hmm. and Twitter that they're like, they don't want to touch it. It's easier just to like accept Sweep it. Sweep it under the rug. Right. And just worry about it later, you know, mm -hmm. because if they start saying, well, we have to create a different division or a different league or this can't happen, then the mob essentially will come after them. Mm -hmm. And then who knows what? Yes. Like people I are so. I was told to keep quiet. Yeah. By someone very high ranking. And they said, for your own safety, you should probably keep quiet. And I said, I'm, you can't silence me. I right. won't be silenced. Good. So I'm going to speak up because I don't believe this is fair. Women and girls deserve a fair playing field. Totally. I like it. Cynthia, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your information. Yeah. Uh, so you're on Instagram, Fast Over 40. A lot of great tips and information for people there. You have the book. Uh, and then if people want to connect with you, maybe be, you know, uh, be a client of yours, how can they connect with you? Um, just through my website, ma'am808.com. And uh, yeah, just send me a message. And uh, I do phone consultations for people on the mainland. I'd give an extensive interview. Um, or in person, I do a full metabolic assessment where I measure 14 different places on where you store your body fat. And the mm. ratio between those places tells me all kinds of information on how I can help. That's awesome. The body caliper, like that, yeah, I look, I think you have it. Maybe we'll cut to some B-roll and show that. That's really neat. Um, in closing, what's like the, the, obviously you've learned so much. We all have with mentors and research and scientists and all that. Like if there's one thing you wish you, you would have known or started implementing in your life earlier, um, what would it be? Like it just like. Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, Gosh, I think it would be um, just to take care of my sleep hygiene mm. mostly and um, eat more steak. <laughs> nice. I like that. Yeah. It makes such a big difference, sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting the phone out of the bedroom, blue, lo blue blockers and all that. Yeah. Yes. And also one thing that uh, some people will say is, uh, oh, well, my dog sleeps with me or my cat wakes me up in the middle of the night. And I'm like, look, your sleep is more important. I'm sorry to yeah. be the bearer of bad news, but it's more important. So find a way that you can get the best sleep that you mm -hmm. can. Um, so if that means that your husband snores and he needs to sleep in a different bed, then do it. You can be intimate at a different, different time. Right. You know, like there are ways to work around it, but you really, really, really need to prioritize your sleep. We didn't get too much into the sleep, but I do have a whole chapter in my book about it. Um, and so important. yeah, and of course, injury rate increases if you have poor sleep but everything so one of the ways uh people get alzheimer's is poor sleep mm -hmm. they know that now um the uh, lymphatic system is busy cleaning out especially in the later hours in the morning mm -hmm. so that the longer you sleep the better you can detoxify and uh yeah so i would say i would just make sure that i got really good sleep from the start <laughs> totally yep because <clears throat> when you're younger you can get away with crap your sleep and like pull it off because you're resilient you're younger but as you get you know closer to 50 60 and 70 right you you definitely rely upon um all the the, the wonderful benefits that sleep offers so mm -hmm. amazing tip uh thanks again for coming on yeah thank you for having me